Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. We invite you to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Because we are new to the world of podcasts, taking time to give us a review or a thumbs up will mean a great deal to us and will help us reach more people. This week, I have a wonderful guest with me, Father James Martin. Father Martin is a Jesuit priest, editor-at-large for America Magazine, and author of several best-selling, award-winning books, including The Abbey, The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything, Between Heaven and Mirth, Building a Bridge, and Jesus, a Pilgrimage. Father Martin frequently provides commentary in such places as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and on all the major television and radio networks. Jim, it's so good to have you with us today. You wrote the foreword to the anniversary edition of The Return of the Prodigal Son. In this you say, the most arresting feature of this book is, for me, the author's near total candor. Tell me a little bit about what that book did for you. Well, I think it's one of the greatest um, exegesises or opening up uh, of scripture that I've ever read. I, I think that you know, his ability to take that one story and dive deep into it and open it up for us and also be honest about, you know, as he is in all of his writings, as you know better than anyone, uh, you know, his own struggles, his own failings, his own uh, neediness at times, I think really cements um, his relationship with the reader. And frankly, you know, when I write, he's one of my models, um, him and Thomas Merton, but especially now on in his openness. And I think that just draws you in and it makes you want to trust this person and also, uh, you know, go along with this person. But, you know, frankly, I think that the message of that book, I think that whenever I preach on the prodigal son, I I always use, and I always quote him now insight, which is that, uh, you know, we act like the younger son. We uh, feel like the older son, but we, you know, should be uh, living like the father. That, that's that's for me. That's the book in a sentence. But so it's. I think it's just a brilliant book, frankly. And um, I I'm writing my own book on Lazarus, and I'm using his book as a model right now. What what he did for the prodigal son, I'm trying to do for Lazarus. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, I, I am loving your books and loving your posts, your social media posts as well. So it's, it's neat to hear you talk about that and about how Henry has influenced your writing. Um, did, did you ever meet Henry, by the way, or, did, or have you just got to know him like most of us got to know him through his writing? Through his writings, uh, you know, I know a lot of people uh, who knew him. Um, and uh, no, but, you know, I, um, I entered the Society, the, the Society of Jesus in 1988. Um, and that's when I first got interested in his writings. And I, I really can't, I can't pick a favorite book. I think for me, the Genesee diary was the one that uh, opened me up to him. And again, you know, as you know, he's so honest in that book about, um, you know, wanting to, in a sense, get away from the hustle and bustle of his life and then finding himself in the monastery and then feeling, uh, lonely, uh, and, you know, do people need me? And that, that's really, that's really hard to talk about. Um, in fact, even my mother, it's funny. Uh, she, I've, I've spoken enough about now. And, and, um, when I go on retreat, she'll sometimes say, well, are you going to be lonely like Henry now was? <laughs> 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 so Aww. that's even, you know, that, that honesty even penetrated, uh, you know, kind of our relationship, you know, with my mom that, in other words, that made a, that, that insight that he had really made a profound effect on her too. I, it's funny because I think the Genesee Diary was the one that really broke through to me too. It was it was quite mm. profound, and um, you mentioned something which I, I loved in your forward to the Return of the Prodigal Son. You mentioned you know that he actually within the book says that he wants to be remembered after he's after he's dead, and it's interesting because I think probably that book more than any other is probably what he will be remembered for. But there's this big body of work, and and it has been so life giving for all of us. Uh, we kind of live in the wake of Henry and that daring honesty um, mm-hmm. and a kind of bare, bared soul reality that we all go, oh, that's me too. That's me too. Well, and I, that's right. And I, as I say, I, I pattern, um, you know, consciously, you know, my writing style on his uh, because I don't think, you know, I'd really never 
read a spiritual writer who, I mean, I'm sure there are others, obviously, I mean, all the way back to St. Augustine, but who shares some of the embarrassing things, too. Yeah. I mean, his his relationship with uh, who just died, I think, uh, Dom John Yudes Bamberger, uh, who is his spiritual director in Genesee Diary, you know, where he wonders, is he mad at me? Does he like me? This kind of need to be liked, I think, is something that runs through um, Nowen's books, which I think everyone can, uh, you know, kind of connect to. And, uh, you know, he has encouraged me, I mean, through his writings to be honest um, yeah. in, in the spiritual life, even about the embarrassing things, you know, cause most spiritual writers say, well, I had this problem and then I, you know, I triumphed over it. Right. Yeah. And aren't I holy and aren't I spiritual? And that's not the sense you get from his writing. He's, he's, he's still, you know, for example, even at the end of Genesee diary, kind of struggling with those feelings of, of worth, worth, worthiness, likability. Um, so really very, very, uh, universal things for people to, to look at. Now, one of the things that I've been catching from you in the last weeks has been your your take on the pandemic. Uh, life got turned upside down for so many of us and uh, for everybody, for the world. We're, we're united with the world in this. Um, there you are in the middle of Manhattan. How's it going? What's working for you? What kind of spiritual practices are working for you? Or just how are you doing life right now? Well, you know, I'm luckier than you know, most people, uh, you know, I'm not sick. And, uh, my mom who's 88 is not sick. Our Jesuit community has not been sick, but you know, there've been a lot of Jesuits that have been affected and have died. Um, I know for example, in, in Pickering, um, in Ontario, there were many Jesuits who died in the infirmary at, uh, St. Joe's university in Philadelphia. We had six Jesuits die. And, wow. you know, I live around the block and as I'm speaking, I can see the windows of Mount Sinai hospital in New York where there are people dying and sick. Um, and so while, you know, I'm quarantined at home, obviously, and working from home, but, you know, I'm, I'm healthy so far. But I, you know, I, I find that just taking it day by day is, is the most important thing. I, I don't think you can sort of get into the what ifs. I mean, we all have to take precautions, obviously, and be careful about not spreading the disease. But, you know, what if this continues for the next year or two? Right. I mean, I think just taking it day by day is very important and just being centered and grounded in the present. It's interesting because I think sometimes people take on this agenda in their head, like I've got to accomplish so much. I've got a different, Mm. you know, availability. But there is something that really, I I don't know, I've I've found myself saying it's like a malaise. It's, It's sometimes hard to lift the cloud. And I can't help but wonder what is going to be different after this? Do you have thoughts about and longings for what might be in the future after this well you know that that's interesting i hope something is different um but you know human nature is such that we tend to want to forget these things i I remember reading an article recently about the spanish flu and i don't know if you can call it that the flu in 1918 where there's very little written about it and people you know were consumed with the war world war one and they wanted to just kind of get on with things and so if you think about it, there's very little in our culture that talks about the flu from 1918. Uh, you know, I hope that people learn, as Pope Francis said, it's not God's judgment on us. It's it's our judgment on what's important, family, friends, life. I do think it is exposing the inequalities, uh, you know, the, the people who are uh, beyond the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers. You have people like grocery clerks and transit workers who, you know, are kind of forced to go to work to make things continue. And it's kind of a, a, a disparity between the rich who can stay at home and the poor who cannot. I, but truly, I, I hope we do remember these things because I think we tend to just move on. And, and it's difficult for us to contemplate not only these difficult questions of inequality on the healthcare, but also difficult questions of powerlessness. I think that in the, in the West, we're very reluctant to say this is something that we are. I mean, we hope that there will be a, a vaccine, but, you know, we are currently powerless over this. And it's, you know, the German, uh, I think he's German film director, uh, Werner Herzog, um, talked, about, talked about nature's monumental indifference. <laughs> and I think that's something we're uncomfortable with. I, I would agree with you. I mean, I, it, has, it has underlined the inequities 
and it mm-hmm. does give us pause to really think how will we how do we want it to be different because we have to be part of the wanting it to be different it won't just automatically happen we have to kind of lift up the banners of what we believe in and and move them forward um, well, that's right. And, and also, uh, you know, we I, I remember uh, 9-11. I was here in New York City in 2001. And people said then, I remember it, everything will change. You know, everything will change in the city, everything. And, you know, not a whole lot did. I mean, the area around Ground Zero changed, of course. But, you know, we went to war. That changed. But I don't. I didn't see a huge shift in the culture in New York City, where people became more kind and friendly. And it just there, there's a there's a you know Gore Vidal, the American writer, talked about the United States of amnesia. <laughs> uh-huh. we, we tend to want to just forget and and move on. So I I I really hope that we do take these things seriously. But you know, like in in every person's life, if if a tragedy comes. Some people may reflect on it and learn from it and take uh, some sort of meaning from it and, and see God in it. And some people won't, right? Yeah. So it's a, it depends. Now, um, I'd love to talk about a couple of your books because I've just really been enjoying them. Uh, the first one being Building a Bridge, which I think mm-hmm. is a great book and obviously must have, must have ruffled feathers but must have also <laughs> delighted some people. I know you originally wrote this for the LGBT Catholics and for church officials. Um, Tell me a little bit about the response and tell me a bit about who really has embraced what you're saying here. And just take us there with, it's a wonderful book. Sure, thanks. So it's about the church reaching out to the LGBT community. Uh, And it came in the wake of the Pulse nightclub massacre in 2016 where I felt that the church really uh, barely expressed their sympathy, you know, when 49 people were killed in this, in this gay nightclub or largely gay nightclub. Uh, and the, the book was initially, well, it was supposed to be very modest and it initially is a very small book. There was a second edition that came out and I was shocked at the reaction, both positive and negative, the positive reaction, you know, far outweighed the negative reaction, but uh, you know, a, a huge crowds, uh, you know, 700, 800 people in packed parishes, standing ovations, people hugging me, crying. And I thought, well, this is really surprising because the book is pretty modest. It doesn't challenge any church teaching or it just basically invites people to treat LGBT people with respect, compassion and sensitivity. But I think that the conversation apparently needed to happen. And then the 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 backlash happened, which was a lot of personal vilification, you know, attacks on me personally, mm-hmm. online mainly, protests and name calling, and I've been called every name in the book. Truly, it was like you know, it's like you felt like you were on a junior high school playground. <laughs> uh, and then what I would call the pushback to the pushback. Then I had people like Cardinal Supich, Archbishop Gregory, uh, inviting me to speak. Um, you know, I got invited to the World Meeting of Families, and then. Last September, uh, Pope Francis invited me to a, a private audience in the in the Apostolic Palace, and so that was kind of the ultimate <laughs> the ultimate pushback to the pushback, you know, which left me completely inspired. And you know, he was very supportive. I'll just I'll leave it at that. Oh, that's so good to hear. I'm I'm just delighted to hear that. Um, y- you know, you conclude that the book is about dialogue and prayer. Do you think it's helping? And what do you think? Are you going to write another book? Are, are you going to take it farther? I'm curious. Where, where are we going to go with this? Well, you know, I think I've said my piece in that book, and it is about it's about dialogue. Both I don't like to call them sides, but you know, there's yeah. the LGBT community and the church because you know LGBT Catholics are part of the church. Um, I think it is helping. I mean, I, you know, I think the Pope's uh, invitation to an audience that word got all over the world there were photos sent out and uh and i think that gave a great boost to lgbt people look you know i'm not saying this is as a result of the book but you know two years ago even using the word lgbt in some circles was considered too much yeah. uh so there's two things that are going on and and not not uh you know uh definitely related to the book number one pope francis is simply putting in more and more cardinals archbishops and bishops who are open to that community And number two, more and more people are coming out. And as they come out, they bring those uh, desires and joys and struggles into their families and then into their parishes. And that affects dioceses and that affects the church. So, 
even if the first trend stops, if Pope Francis, you know, God forbid, if he dies tomorrow uh, and he stops appointing people, the second trend, which is more and more openness in, in society, is not going to stop. Absolutely. It, it It's really interesting. I, I loved where you began it, you know, when you talked about, you know, when you've been received in baptism, you're a member of the church, period. Yeah. End of story. Yeah, and I, 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 I love that. Thanks. Yeah, I always say to people, you know, who feel that they're being, you know, in a sense, pushed out of the church, you know, LGBT people. Um, yeah, look, you're baptized. You're as much a part of the church as uh, as me, as your local pastor, as your local bishop or Pope Francis, period. I mean, you're baptized Catholic. Yeah. The end. At the end. Well, um, let me ask you the question. Now, the book didn't go anywhere near some of the really rough topics right now, like the clergy sexual abuse. You didn't go there. Um, why not? Well, uh, mainly because the book was, you know, that 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 topic, you know, the book wasn't about. It was about the LGBT community. And I certainly didn't want to bring it up because, you know, that equates in people's minds, you know, homosexuality with pedophilia, you know, which yeah, we know is yeah. false. You know, you're yeah, not because yeah. you're gay. You're not a sex abuser. I mean, I, t- I talk about it a little in the book, but I also didn't want to bring it up because I think any, uh, you know, any any sort of introduction to that very complex topic you know the causes are so you know complex right about those crimes i I think to bring it up and just you know like mention it and or or bring it up in a sort of incomplete way would have been kind of almost insulting you know to to people and it just it just wasn't about that but but really there's this again there's this false equation a lot of people who are homophobic say well you know, if you're gay or if you're a, if you're a gay priest, you know, even if you're celibate and chaste, as you know, gay priests are supposed to be like straight priests, then therefore you're a child abuser, which is baloney. So I bring it up in that uh, sort of vein. But to go into the sex abuse crisis, which I've written about elsewhere, I thought was kind of uh, not not part of that book's scope, which yeah. was, it's a very short book, too. Yeah, yeah. I I take it that it started out of a talk and then it was just such a hit that it needed to be out there. It really needed to be out there, which I, I, I'm glad you did it. I'm really glad that thanks, you did it. You. Yeah. Now, the fun for me, because I said, well, what are we going to talk about? And you said, well, what about Jesus, A Pilgrimage, which is just a fabulous book. I have to tell you, Thank though, you. given the COVID shutdown of everything, I went after getting the book right away. I should have done it as an audiobook, and I would have been able to download it or download it on Kindle, but instead I sent for it. It arrived at four o'clock yesterday afternoon, oh, and great. it's it's close to about five five hundred and forty pages. So yes, I can't tell you long. I read the whole book, but my <laughs> gosh, I really enjoyed what I got into, and I was even reading Thanks. in the middle of the night. I was really enjoying it. Uh, I, I love what people write about it. They say you know it's infectious, travelogue, spirituality, theological reflection combined with wit and human insight. That's from the tablet, and it's funny. You really surprised me with the book because in a way, you got me from the beginning. I had the same unique experience. About eight years ago, I went to Israel and did a four-part documentary series called Journey to Christmas. And it it was profound for me. We had a wonderful spiritual guide who kind of took us into the the story behind everything. Mm. So last night, as I get into your early chapters, which are about, you know, Mary's yes, and then Bethlehem, and then Nazareth, I've I've been there and it just was so alive to me. But Mm. I found it just such an insightful, interesting book. I'm really, uh, I I can't imagine you're not the same after having had that trip. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, and I've, I've led uh, five or six pilgrimages since then. And I always tell the pilgrims, you know, like this is going to change your life because at the very least, you're never going to read the gospel stories the same way again. You know, names that, you know, like Capernaum, where people think, oh, whatever, that when you're there and you see where it is and what it was like and how long Jesus spent there and how many miracles he did there, you think, oh, my gosh. And so when you hear the word Capernaum again, you're you're sort of brought back there, and it really sort of grounds the Gospels yeah. in a way that's hard to describe. But um, I just had fun. Now, I think, you know, people who are listening, they say, oh, my gosh, because of time, health, money, fear, I'll never go there. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, to give you this experience of being there and being on pilgrimage and, 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 
and and finding new things about the gospels you know i just i just love learning about the daily life of jesus it's fascinating to me endlessly fascinating well the book had to me had a really special charm because i i just constantly felt your sense of wow jesus walked here yeah. wow this happened here <laughs> and i had felt exactly the same thing and uh you know what a privilege that we both had that experience and wonderful yes. that you've been able to share it with others it's interesting because my Journey to Christmas brought together four people that we took with us. One was an atheist, one was a uh, a Jewish uh, fellow, and one was, uh, and two of them were at different stages of kind of Christian faith. So those four people were kind of taking a look at this and trying to figure out what's here for us. And it was mm. there were some wonderful discussions in it. But out of it, I thought, okay, I want to do Journey to Easter, and I never got to do that. But mm. um, nevertheless, I mean. Uh, I come back and I think there's something about understanding that this story is real. This story is real. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you? No, no, you didn't. No, no, no. Just that that there's a, it connects Jesus to a land, to a place, to a. Yeah. And I, I was going to say, I love what uh, Harvey Cox, of uh, the professor at Harvard said. He said, do we really need yet another book about Jesus? If this book, if the book is this one, the answer is yes. And, uh, well, you're right, and you know when people go there, when I uh, accompany pilgrims there, they almost all, someone almost always says, you know, I, I believe in, I've always believed in Jesus. You know, these are very faithful Catholics. I knew that there was such a thing as the Sea of Galilee, but I always thought it, the part of me always thought it was almost like semi mythical, and then you see it. And you say, this is clearly, there, there are a few places you can stand, and one of them is on the Sea of Galilee. And you can say, without a doubt, Jesus saw this. You know, Jesus yeah. himself mm-hmm. saw this view. And it's amazing. I'm getting goosebumps right now just thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing to think that. And it, you know, again, it, it makes him real for people. A, a friend of mine before I left said that it was also like um, visiting a friend's home and family. You know, you might yeah. think you know your friend really well, but if you go to the friend's home and you see where they grew up, it just it just opens things up for you in a, in a brand new way. Yeah, you get the context of this is where they were shaped and formed. And yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, well, I followed you as far as I got into the book, into the middle of the night. I followed you and went, oh, I'm <laughs> going to, I, I know I'm going to finish this because it's just, it's quite delicious, but I do feel kind of like a companion to you on the trip because as Thanks. you get really into the details of the place you're looking at, it brings it back to my memory and it brings it back to some very moving moments that, um, I just found it was like a pivot point for me as well. It was quite special. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most people, they're they're not the same after that. It it you know they as you know that that's one of the reasons they call the Holy Land the fifth gospel. It's it's coming in. It, it's having an encounter with, in a sense, the, the the story told in a different way. And so, for example, when you see, uh, you know, even just the distances. So mm-hmm. you see, well, okay, well, Jesus went from. Nazareth to the Sea of Galilee. And, you know, in your mind, you say, well, that's nice. Well, (laughs) then when you see how long it takes through a valley that's very rocky and over mountains and cliffs, and you say, oh, okay. Or Jesus's family, as in Mark chapter three, you know, come to restrain him, you know, because they're so worried about him and they think he's crazy. You know, and you say, well, Mary and his extended family, you know, walked that way just to how how frustrated and upset must they have been with him right it just it just it just deepens it for me and and it deepens it for anyone who's been there and that's what i try to do with the book to really deepen that experience for the reader i found that it was so accessible you i mean you had the guides telling us about the locations but you had great theological insights but then there's this very personal revelation from your own heart the the kind of um it really, truly is a pilgrimage, and you really, truly are, are, are giving us to what you got in that moment. And there's an immediacy to that. And I, I would just recommend the book for everybody. I just think you, you'll, you'll Thank so you. enjoy it. I mean, it's really a good well, book. Well, <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to the beginning of our conversation. A lot of that comes from Henry Nowen. Mm-hmm. And so I think had I not read people like, you know, other ones, yeah. of course, you know, Henry yeah. Nowen, Thomas Merton, I would point to also Kathleen Norris. Uh, who's a big favorite of mine. You know, if I had not read spiritual writers like that, but especially now on, the book would have been just 
theology and travelogue, right? Yeah. But the, the, the third part, which is spirituality and sort of my own, you know, experiences on that trip, that's, that's now. And I mean, that's where that comes from. So it's like the prodigal son, you know, you know, he could have easily written a book about, or Genesee Diary, he could have easily written a very dry book about what it is like to be in a monastery or what, what this parable of Jesus is, says to us today. And that would have been fine. You know, he could have talked about theology and in the, in the case of the prodigal son, he could have talked about theology and scripture, but it's the added part of his own life. And then in the Genesee Diary, you know, it's not just you know, here's what it, it is like to live in a monastery. It's here's my experience and my struggles. Uh, mm. And that, frankly, is the most, I think that's the most important part of both books, you know? Um, Ron Rollheiser um, has been mm. really a leading expert on Henry. And mm. it's interesting because one of the things he talks about is that really Henry gave us the language of spirituality. I think that's really interesting. He kind of talks about, you know, there was a time when that, didn't exist in quite the same way. I find mm. that fascinating to think that that may be one of his big contributions. Um, I think I think that's a great. You know, that's really interesting to hear you say that because I, I, look, I am not a scholar of spirituality, and so I trust people like Ron Rollheiser. I think that's. Re- I've always had that uh, intuition mm-hmm. that it was him. Uh, you know, because it is true. I mean, before if you read, I mean, you, see, you know, obviously, so, you know, Teresa of Lisieux talks very openly about her struggles, and Dorothy Day does. But there's a kind of, um, again, I think it's stuff that he, he that he reveals, which is kind of embarrassing things, mm-hmm. right? I mean, I only, I mean, Dorothy Day in her diaries does that, but not in you know the books that she had published, you know, before she died. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, I think that's accurate, and I think that's the kind of spirituality or spiritual writing today that attracts people. Now, some people don't like it, some people mm-hmm. hate it. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, you know, it's all about you or it's it's too, uh, you know, it's too solipsistic or too yeah. egotistical. And, but I I find it really draws people in. It just it just does. Now, I think you have to strike a balance because it can't all be, you know, it can't all be me, me, me. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not in his books. It's it's always, you know, this kind of narrative theology. It, it's for a purpose. It's to help the reader. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, what are the projects you're working on now, by the way? What, what have you got on the go? Yeah, well, I just finished a book. We're looking at the covers now called uh, Learning to Pray, uh, which will be out, God willing, next year. Uh, it's called Learning to Pray, A Guide for Everyone. It really is. It's a, it's a guide to prayer from soup to nuts. And I always say, you know, I, I like to think about giving these books to people who know nothing about, for example, Jesus or Ignatian spirituality or prayer in this case. And then I'm writing this book on Lazarus, the raising of Lazarus. And really, my my model is the return of the prodigal son, which is to take a part of Scripture that is rich and that appeals to me and really open it up. Um, I'm doing a little bit more uh, scripture analysis than he would have done, you know, in the prodigal yeah. son, which, yeah. you know, takes off as, you know, from the painting and the story itself. But that's my idea. Like as, as he did it for the prodigal son, I'm, I'm going to try to do it in my own way. Um, you know, not sort of comparing myself to him uh, with the raising of Lazarus, which is, I think my favorite gospel story. It's, it's interesting. Um, somebody shared something with me that I that just really stuck a note with me about that story and it was why well, was Lazarus home with his sisters and mm-hmm. wondering about whether he what might have been uh, perhaps developmentally delayed he might have needed yep. those sisters to care for him and I was so touched by that that to me was really significant I don't know where you're going to go with it but I know for me uh, I thought he loved Lazarus and that meant a lot. You know, who was this person well, that he loved? Yeah, and, you know, especially, I mean, you, you think about Henry Nouwen's book, Adam, right, yeah. and his relationship with the large community. But I had heard yeah. that. Uh, and then, you know, that, that, that there, it, I mean, I could talk about that for like an hour now. But, you know, Lazarus, as you said, you know, he, he's with his sisters, first of all. And also, it's called the house of Martha and Mary. You know, it's, yeah. it's Jesus went to not Martha's house, not Lazarus's house and not their yeah. father's house. Yeah. OK. Uh, and also Lazarus has no lines. To, Lazarus says nothing in the Gospels. Right. Uh, you know, why is that? And that, as you say, one of the one of the thoughts is that he may have been in some way disabled. 
the other insight, which is fascinating and which sort of blew my mind, and I hope blows your mind, is that um, many scholars today believe that Lazarus is the mysterious beloved disciple in John's gospel, oh. uh, who, is the orig- who is the sort of origin of the story that we find in John's gospel. And it is not so, it's not so out there if you think about it. Um, yeah. He is called he whom you love. Yeah. Um, the beloved disciple is, you know, the one whom Jesus loves. And there are many little clues at the very end of John's gospel, which I find fascinating. You remember in John 21, when Jesus meets Peter by the seashore and he says, you know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Right. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Right. At the very, very end, there's this very strange passage where Peter turns to Jesus and says, what about him? Is he going to die? about the beloved disciple. And most people say, oh, that's interesting. Well, who would they say that about? Why would they expect some, you know, fisherman from their group or a tax collector to never die? They would probably say that about Lazarus. Is he going to die again? Right, right. And yeah, Uh yeah, exactly. And so there's lots of little kind of clues like that. So Lazarus, yes, he may have been disabled or may have been the beloved disciple, or may have been a leper. That's the other thought, um, that that, that Mary and Martha and Lazarus were all lepers. Yeah. They had leprosy, Hansen's disease. So anyway, well, I'm trying to do what Henry did for (laughs) the prodigal son. If I get halfway there, if it's it's halfway (laughs) as good as that book, I'll be very happy. Well, I find it delightful to see, like, who would have thought Jesus, a pilgrimage, would be on the bestseller list of the New York Times? But you write in such an accessible and such an engaging way, and and, and I'm sure that the next one will be very much the same. I do need to ask you one thing. There's another part of your writing life, your editor-at-large for America Magazine. Mm Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's such an important magazine. Tell me just a little bit about what what does it mean to be editor at large on, in that context? Well, my joke is I can write whatever I want to write. <laughs> <laughs> so because I take a vow of poverty as a Jesuit, um, as a member of the Society of Jesus, all of my earnings, whatever I, I mean, everything, you know, goes to the Jesuits. Okay. Uh-huh. So for example, when I, you know, get a paycheck from America, it goes to um, my community. Um, but the royalties from my book all go to the magazine. Okay. Um, and so, yeah. So that's kind of my work, which is to write books and also, you know, to bring in money and give talks and things like that. Uh, so, you know, I'm an editor like every other editor. I don't edit articles anymore. I can say thank God. Um, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm in the office every day, or at least I was. Um, and I write and articles and, you know, work with the staff. And I love it. I hope I never leave. I really, I love writing. Love it, love it, love it. Just really love it. And so there's this prayer book and then the Lazarus book. And there's good and, things you know, coming. Assuming <laughs> there's a, there are a lot of things coming. Yeah. So uh-huh. I have a lot of plans. Hopefully I'll be able to accomplish some of them. Well, you know, I I, I kind of know there's good things coming too because every so often I I send out an invite to you and say, would you come for this or would you come for that? And then you you really you you're careful with your time. You are making good decisions about your time, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing to note too. What to say yes to, what to say no to, but it it's interesting to hear much how much you love writing that that. It shows on the page. It really does show. Yeah, on the thanks. Page. And, thanks, and part of it is also I know that if I travel, I can't write. Oh. Uh, and I, and of course, who knows what travel is going to be? You know, in the yeah. next you know year or so. Um, but I, I, you know, look. If I, I have a little carpal tunnel, so I have to be careful about how much I write physically. But frankly, if I could write all day, truly, I'd be happy. I mean, I really. <laughs> some people hate it, but I, I love it. <laughs> I I just love it. I fear the blank page, but I'm glad to know somebody out there loves it. I'm so glad to hear that. Can oh I just... no! Look, I always say my my um, my in, my advice to people is always to say to yourself, "What do I want to say?" That's all, and then yeah. just say it. And yeah. the other thing is, if you're worried about you know saying the best thing or writing the best way, someone said to me, "The greatest cure for writer's block is this: immediately lower your standards." <laughs> that's that's perfect that 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 will help me that will help me Good. i find that the whole business is just put something on the page and i always think it's awful but the next day i look at it and i go that wasn't too bad we're, we're going yeah. somewhere with this yeah, yeah. I, I, I think i find that helpful can i ask you something that it's sort of a, a, in a closing question you know you have said some wonderful things about henry now and but one of the things that i in a sense in this role as the executive director of the now society we long 
to share what Henry has to offer with the next generation. But really, there is a question. Is Henry needed at this time? Is there Are there things that you feel Henry has to say that don't come from anywhere else? Or let, just let me hear a little bit from you on that. Oh, yeah. I, I still think what Rollheiser said is important, which is that, you know, he is the I would say that the groundbreaking voice in Catholic spirituality, um, you know, after Merton and Dorothy Day, who didn't write in his style. Yeah. I mean, they, they simply didn't. You know, Thomas Merton in his diaries, he's open, but not as transparent. And I think young people really crave that sense of authenticity and honesty. And I also think his his emphasis on, um, you know, on people who are forgotten in society Right. I mean, Adam, for example, uh, and, you know, some of the insights he has from his work in L'Arche is is really helpful. I find that voice so appealing. So, for example, uh, I used to run a book club uh, at the Church of St. Ignatius Loyola, the Jesuit church in New York City. And we would read, um, you know, we would read Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mounts and we would read The Long Loneliness by Dorothy Day, two of my heroes. Right. And yeah. You know, Dorothy, Dorothy Day's on her way to sainthood and should be. And I'll have to tell you, some of the young people didn't like him. You know, they didn't like Merton because, you know, he's pretty, he can be pretty full of himself, right? Mm-hmm. Especially at that time in his life. Dorothy Day, they found, you know, they found the book too long. <laughs> and she's extreme, you know, she's mm-hmm. extremely cerebral. And, you know, now and was very bright too. They all loved the, Gen- the, Gen- the Genesee Diary. They loved it. You know, and they just so... There's something about that voice that I think speaks to young people, especially today. They just, they just it, it's honest. I think people trust him in a sense. Well, he's not he, as, he's not as, he's not as sort of forbidding, I would say, also as Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton. I, I think probably one of the things that I found so, in a way, endearing is he keeps taking us down another level inside of himself, and when he, yeah. and he does it within us as well. And it is that issue of self-loathing. Which I went, oh my goodness! Somebody just talked to some very deep places in my secret being, the self-loathing well, issues and things like that that he had words for, and you go, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's me. Well, and he's also a psychologist, and so you trust him in that sense too. Yeah. It's not simply someone flailing around and throwing out, you know, insights mm-hmm. that may or may not be helpful. I mean, this is someone who has a very um, you know, deep psychological background and psychological training and also, you know, spiritual training. And so, so you trust him too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, not, not everyone has to have a degree to be trustworthy, obviously, but I trust him when it comes to the psychological stuff. And also, you know, I also knew people who knew him. Uh, did you know him yourself? Yes, I did. I did. I did. Uh, I actually have a story where in essence, I pursued him once I started once somebody gave me his books, I pursued mm. him. I was doing a program at the time called Cross Currents, which was kind of a roundtable mm. forum. Oh, sure. And eventually got to uh, bring him to the program, or we went to him, and then ultimately he died a year later. And then I realized I had some of the best material on mm. Henry, and that's when I started doing the documentary Journey of the Heart, The Life of Henry Now. And, but I really, in a way, got to know him through his friends, as opposed to like— Now, I'm curious— I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, I was just going to say, I, I got to know him through his friends, his family, his colleagues. In a mm. sense, I, it, you know, sometimes you do a documentary and you're telling the story you believe you know. But in this instance, I felt like I was framing a story that they knew. They had mm. loved and lived with him and mm. got the good and bad of him. And so Journey of the Heart is really... Uh, brings together that account. We have that on mm. our website, and it's anybody can download it if they want to know, in a sense, Henry's story. There, it's there. Now, how would you describe him if you were to describe him to you know someone who didn't know him? What would you say? What What was he like in person? Uh, I think he was a uh, very intelligent, energetic, uh, needy. <laughs> Wonderful. I've heard that word. I've heard that word a couple times from about from friends. Yeah. Yeah. Needy. Wonderful. Uh, um, one of the things that I I saw in Henry as I kind of pursued him was how he was always learning. How there was always something mm. new. And you know, I kind of mm. hear that in you. I mean, you're writing something new. There's always something you're pursuing. You're not. Mm sitting back. I mean, anybody who writes 39 books or 40 books mm-hmm. has, sometimes I've said, did he write 
the same book over and over again, but he didn't really. Mm. He mm-hmm. was growing. He was moving mm-hmm. forward in his life, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and and he was in the process of solving all the things that had held him back. Um, it's funny because some people say, you know, should he be sainted? And then I hear other friends of his say, the people that get sainted are the ones who drove with him, you know, because he wasn't, you know, if you survive well, that, the, you know. <laughs> in, in the Jesuits, we have an expression, you know, the, the saints and the martyrs, the martyrs are the ones that live with, the, that have to live with the saints. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think so. But there were, you know, he, he, he could receive from others and he, um, you know, you captured that, I think, even in your, just in your forward to the return of the prodigal son, clearly Summa Stellar was a person who in her letters and in her presence in his life pushed him forward to understand mm-hmm. God was calling him to be the father. He mm-hmm. could be the, the, the prodigal son. He could be the brother. Mm-hmm. But eventually that call that calls to all of us that we might welcome people home. And I remember one of my pro- most precious memories is just engraved in me was him talking, I'm uh, saying, from the father's perspective, I'm so glad you're back. I'm so glad you're back. And the fact mm. that the father doesn't say, where have you been? What what were you up to? It's just, I'm so yeah. glad mm. you're back. And mm. that kind of a mm-hmm. welcome is, I think, what probably we hope that young people who are looking for yeah. something will hear. I'm so mm. glad you're back. That's a great insight. Yeah, every, I think everybody needs to hear that. True. Exactly. It's beautiful. The other thing I would say, like I'm going to encourage everybody, go out and buy some of these wonderful books. If you haven't read James Martin, uh, check out his uh, social media podcasts. They're great. But I'd also really encourage you. I mean, who would have thought Jesus, a pilgrimage, would be a bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list? But it's really because it's such a delicious book and it's funny and it's honest. And uh, I just would encourage them. Uh, Thank you. James for giving me the time today. It's really been a pleasure to talk with you. You're you're one of the people I enjoy and watch and listen for. So I thank you for being such a rich gift to us at the Henry Nowen Society. Thank you. It's been my pleasure and delight to talk with you and thanks for all the great work you do there. Oh, thank you. Good. Have a great day. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs> all right. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. I hope you come away from this interview with Father James Martin as inspired and moved as I was. I look forward to finishing his book, Jesus, A Pilgrimage, and I'd encourage you to get this as well. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we'd be so grateful if you take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up or even share it with your friends and family. As well, you'll find links in the show notes for our website and any content, resources, or books discussed in this episode. There's even a link to books to get you started in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nowen. Thanks for listening. Until next time.